rain headed our way, apparently, a little bit. My weather app said some light showers should be here within the hour, but they won't last very long. Uh, I don't know if they know where I live, but they act like they do. But we're glad you're here. We're studying Romans 5, beginning in verse 12. But we need to begin in Genesis 3. We're talking about how sin came from Adam and justification through Jesus, Jesus Christ. So we're going to be alluding to the sin that came through Adam. We might as well look at it first rather than talk about it. Let's just go talk with it and be reminded there. Paul makes the statement that uh, in explaining justification that it's not hard for us to understand how something like sin could come through one individual and why should it be difficult to see the type, the pattern that's set with salvation coming through one individual. And talking to Jews, but even before then, uh, Adam wasn't necessarily a Jew. And he sinned way before the law. From Adam to Moses was a long time. And um, so he's making some points about sin coming through the one man, Adam. Genesis 3, the servant, serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord had made. And he said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? And I've written in my Bible that Satan was essentially inferring that God was holding out on us. Why is he holding out on you? Why is he limiting you? And that is used many times by individuals to encourage them to do something they ought not to do or buy something they don't really need. The modern example of that is you deserve this. If you notice a lot of the advertisements, you deserve this. And, well, of course I deserve it, so I'll figure out how to pay for it. I deserve this. But is God holding out on you, he's suggesting? Did God really say that? And the woman said to the serpent, you may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. And he did not say you must not touch it, but Eve suggests that, and you will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Satan, in most of his comments about God, and even using Scripture, will say some things that are correct. They did learn something about good and evil because of this circumstance. But they were not doing it with their eyes open. And God said, don't do it. And there's no getting around that. And the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food, pleasing to the eye, and desirable for gaining wisdom. Now, there again, as we saw a few weeks ago, quickly, from James 1, you have desire, deception, disobedience that leads to spiritual death. What stage do we see here? The desire part. She saw it. She saw that it was good. It was pleasing. It looked good. And it was desirable. The word's even used. So the desires that we have within us are what Satan will use to lead us toward disobedience. The deception is where we've got to be alert because God puts desires within us. It's the deception that we've got to be ready for. And she also, uh, she took some and ate it. And we sometimes miss the latter part of verse 6. She also gave some to her husband who was with her. So here's a picture of a married husband and wife standing there being deceived by Satan. 
And she is involved in the dialogue. She's answering him. She makes the first move, if you will, to reach out and eat of that fruit. And Adam's there the whole time. And there are two or three examples. We won't talk about them now, maybe on Father's Day. But there are two or three examples in Scripture where you have a passive husband. You have a passive husband. What would have happened if Adam says, oh, Eve, we don't do that. Don't listen to him. We're not going to go against God's word. He was there and said and did nothing. A passive leader creates chaos. A passive leader creates chaos. And he was the head of the home. And we'll see in a moment other words added to it. But the silence created chaos here. And so he ate it. And the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked. And they sewed fig trees together and made coverings for themselves. So they became aware of their nakedness. Before, no awareness, no big deal. But suddenly they're noticing that. And they had an open relationship, a walking, talking relationship with God. And they saw their nakedness physically, but they also must have understood their spiritual nakedness before God. That's inferred. And they covered themselves. And then they heard the sound of the Lord as he's walking, and he was afraid uh, because I was naked, so I hid when I heard you in the garden. Verse 10, uh, we're in Genesis 3. And so you see the curse to the serpent, to the woman, to Adam, as you finish the chapters. And then verse 21, the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. So it's the first hint of prophecy about the coming Lord. Without blood, shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness. When you take the skin, the garments off of someone, uh, in this case an animal, garments of skin, an animal died. And it's pointing to that system that was set into place by God and certainly a covering, but it's a messianic prophecy given to us. And the Lord God said, verse 22, the man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. So Satan was correct in that way, but it didn't make disobeying God correct. You must not be allowed to reach out your hands and take also from the tree of life and live forever. And uh, it tells us that the Lord God banished him, Adam, from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. And after he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. So the tree of life, tree of life was still in the garden. It was still viable and he could not let Adam and Eve go back into that garden and reach from the tree of life, eat, and live forever because they had begun to die. If you eat of the tree, you will die. And uh, it's the beginning of spiritual death, but it's the beginning of physical death as well. What does that say? It seems to suggest that God created mankind, put him in the perfect place, and it wasn't his plan that death would come to them, physical death would come. And they had the ability in the Garden of Eden to reach of the tree of life and live forever. But man changed that. God had to alter his plan, but he had a plan in mind since before the creation of the world that when man sins, I will provide a savior and they can be back in fellowship with me. That fallen situation will be restored. And that's something of our theme today from Romans 5. Uh, turn to 1 Thessalonians 2. There's some things I can't fully understand and therefore I can't fully explain it. 
But he's talking about here the, how the household of God should conduct itself. That's the theme of the book of 1 Timothy. How the household of God ought to conduct themselves. Uh, 1 Timothy 3 verse 15. Uh, it's God's household which is the church of the living God. He gives us something about worship. And there's no question that chapter 2 is dealing with worship. He talks about prayers. He talks about who should offer those prayers. And I want men everywhere to lift up holy hands in prayer without anger or disputing. He addresses the 1 Timothy 2 verse 8. And in verse 9, I also want women to dress modestly. And he talks about being given to good deeds, appropriate for women who profess to worship God. Worship, worship, worship is definitely the theme. But verse 11 is a statement of reality based upon history. And it's when he gives us the, exam uh, the explanation, it becomes a little harder to hold on to. A woman should learn in quietness and full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or have authority over a man. She must be silent. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. Now let, let his explanation sink in. Man came first, Adam, then Eve. And Adam was not the one deceived. Paul has taken us back to the Garden of Eden where Eve is going through a discussion, give and take, with the serpent. And she sees, reaches, eats, and then she gives it to her husband. And the fact that she was participating with Satan and was the first to be deceived and to eat of that fruit, Paul is using that fall, and he says, Adam was not the one deceived. It was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. So she's the one that was deceived in the garden to eat of that fruit. I would say first, but it's her deception that's accented by Paul. And, but women will be kept safe through childbirth if they continue in faith and love and holiness with propriety. So she gave the fruit to Adam, but she was the one who was deceived, although he was standing there the whole time. I'm not sure I understand it fully, but Paul makes it very clear. It's this, this, this. We don't have to understand it to see what he's telling us. And how do we apply it? It takes a lot more than three minutes in reading seven verses to apply 1 Timothy 2 as it discusses the role of women and is this public, is it private? What's, what's the ramifications of these words? Uh, so we go back and we see sin comes into the world. And we're going to see it related to, uh, beginning at verse 12, we're also going to see life, eternal life, comes through one man as well, through Christ. One man, Satan, sin, and one man, eternity, Christ. And that's where Paul is in Romans 5, verse 12. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin... And in this way death came to all men, because all sinned. For before the law was given, sin was in the world. But sin is not taken into account when there is no law. Now that's a difficult understanding. One's clearer, another more difficult. The Adam and Eve circumstance was many, many years before the law was given through Moses. So when he says there was no law, there's no Old Testament law. There's no giving to Moses to then be shared with God's chosen people, Israel. That isn't in place in the garden. It wasn't in place for a long time. And so he's telling us that sin was here before the law. Now let that sink in for a second. Sin was here before the law. 
And we saw in Romans 1.18, the eternal power and deity of God is revealed from creation. Galatians, uh, Romans 2 tells us that the Gentiles who did not have the law had a conscience. And their conscience became their law. And it was witnessing even accusing them. So, uh-oh, you shouldn't do that. That's wrong. You're going you're gonna to get in trouble. That voice that we hear, our conscience telling us, you shouldn't do that. How do you know? I, I don't have it written down anywhere. Is there a, a rule book that tells me that? Before the law, there was. The conscience became their law. And so when he talks about there was no law... Sin was still there. Sin came before the law. Uh, and then he says, sin is not taken into account when there is no law. It's not put against them in the same way. Uh, and we know when the law was given, a sacrificial system was set into place. There were sacrifices offered daily, weekly, monthly, annually. And they were to remind the individuals who were having to kill animals to produce blood that this is God's dealing with sin in our life. And without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness. And that speaks to Christ. So they weren't looked at in the same way before the law was given, but sin was there. Sin was there. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses. Now, what happened in Genesis 3 when they ate of that forbidden fruit? They began to die. You shall surely die. And sometimes we say, wait a minute, they didn't die. Well, they did. They began a spiritual death because... It required a death, a death of an animal and a sin offering, if you will, the first picture of a sin offering to make right what they had done. And it also tells us that even though there was no law, people still died also then between the Garden of Eden and Moses and the giving of the law. How does he describe it? Death reigned. Death reigned. That means death was happening. Death was in control of the human existence, even before the giving of the law. So sin brought death. The law is a slightly different matter, but Paul is encouraging us to realize, but we can understand it. They could too, the church at Rome. There was death before there was a consequence revealed through a law, if you will. Death reigned, and we know death occurred between Adam's sin and the giving of the law in Exodus 20. And then a repetition to come later. Death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking a command a written, spoken command, as did Adam, who was a pattern of the one to come. That's where it's hard for me, and I looked at it several times, and even again this morning, trying to be sure that I was wanting to say it the best way possible. He's telling us that Adam did not sin by breaking a command. Eve was deceived. And the woman deceived Adam, even though he was standing there. And that's, that's difficult for me to fully appreciate of why he was not just as guilty. But he wasn't, according to the Spirit's guidance of Paul in 1 Timothy 2. Adam was not deceived. Eve was deceived. Adam didn't sin by breaking a law. But what was set into place, who Adam was a pattern of the one to come. And that's where the next verses are needed. How is Adam and Christ a pattern? 
How does that set a pattern for us? And he set the scene for that. Pattern there is the word tupos. Uh, it means that it's a sh the other verses sometimes in the Old Testament, it's a shadow or a type. It's a shadow or a type of something to come. My brother-in-law, who's a missionary to the Ukraine, lives now in Montgomery, has for a few years, has written a book about shadows and types of the Old Testament. Uh, and it's very well received by people who want to go and look at some of those principles. But so many things in the Old Testament are shadows or types or patterns for that which is to come. Uh, it's a preparation there for them to then be ready when Christ came. Uh, you can imagine if the old law and the old, law, uh, the old Testament was read and understood by the Jews of that time, they should have seen a lot of things talked about there that would help them to know that Jesus was the Son of God. He was the promised Messiah, but their minds were uh, driven against it. They would choose not to believe exactly what was right in front of them, dead being raised, demons being driven out, uh, gospel preached to the poor, the list of what John the Baptist servants were given by Jesus. Uh, it's, just, it's just amazing what was given to them so they would receive him as the Messiah, especially since they were supposedly looking for him. Well, let's go to 15. He changes now, and he talks about the gift. But the gift is not like the trespass. Trespass is something that you do against. The gift is something that's positive. For if the many died by the trespass of the one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many. What is it that we sing? I don't know if it's in this book. I haven't sung enough out of this book to know which songs are in there. Uh, we're checking on precious memories to lead Wednesday, perhaps, by request. But uh, what, what is it that is suggesting there the gift, the one man, overflowing to the many, and the song, the gospel is for all, of one, da, 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 da. I've lost the words all of a sudden. Da, 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 the gospel is for all. The gospel, the blessed gospel is for all. The gospel is for all. Uh, it's a song that's been sung in the past. That's what he just said. The one trespass came through the one man, but the gift for many also came through the one man, Jesus Christ. Again, the gift of God is not like the result of one man's sin. The gift is different than that which occurred when Adam sinned. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation. They were driven out of the garden. No longer would they see the earth in the same way. The earth was cursed also. Galatians 3 tells, I mean, uh, Genesis 3 tells us that. Romans 8 will tell us that the creation cries out in bondage for release. And that will occur when Christ comes back and this earth is destroyed. But the earth was cursed as well as the people upon it. Their labor would require sweat. Apparently before that it was more of a tending of a beautifully well-kept garden. I have no green thumb and maybe I could have been successful before sin. And I shared with you before when you look out here and at your house probably the thorns on some of the weeds here in South Alabama where are they from? Who put them there? Who should you get mad at when you have to use more effort to
to dig them up and hopefully they won't continue to multiply. Get mad at Satan. They're here because of the cursing of the, of the earth. And uh, weeds are a result of that. They weren't there prior to sin in the Garden of Eden. But the gift of God is not like the result of the one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation. But the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. So what's the difference? It's a multitude of difference. Condemnation or justification. Of course, that's the theme of the book. Condemnation, the result of one man's sin. Justification, even after many trespasses, the result of God's gift of His Son. Justification, right standing before God. Um, for if by the trespass of the one man, death reigned through that one man. This is the third time he says it. Adam and his sin brought death. Eve was the one deceived, but Adam also sinned. And he's using Adam here, the common work of Scripture is to take the male gender and associate it that way, but it's mankind rather than man, if you will. How much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and mercy and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Christ Jesus? Death and life, eternal life. How much more? What picture do you see there? I'm giving you a little bit of a physical understanding. How much more the gift of grace, abundant? The picture is of it's pressed down, it's overflowing. Uh, grace is just overflowing compared to what sin brought into the world. And it involves each person making a choice. The reign of death because of sin, which came through Adam, and the gift of grace, justification, overflowing because of the gift of the one man, Jesus Christ. So again, he's going back to the comparison and there is no comparison. There's just no comparison. We're studying the second half of the book, Romans 5, before we hear a lesson later on the first half. I wanted to save the, not the better of the two, but the one that I think has more of an impact uh, less, less explanation, more of an impact for the larger audience, uh, even though we're Facebook living this, and I hope those who will watch it later perhaps will watch Romans 5.1 before you watch Romans 5 part 2, if you have that choice. Um, do you feel the grace of God, a gift overflowing? Go back to Adam in the garden. Is God expecting too much? Is he holding out on you? Are you half saved? Any of us? Are any of us feeling as if I'm just barely saved? This gift of grace? There's no comparison to death reigning and this gift of life, which is here in abundant God's abundant provision. I want to read you. I've read it once before. I guess when we studied Ephesians. Do an MP3 search on YouTube and find this song. Uh, it's on the DVD that a cappella or Praise and Harmony put out called Beautiful God. The title is His Mercy is More by Matt Papa. P-A-P-A. -A the pronunciation. What love could remember no wrongs 
we have done, omniscient, all-knowing, he counts not their sum, thrown into a sea with bottom or shore, our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. They're not held against us. They're cast into a sea that has no bottom and no shore. In other words, they can never come back to life. They can't wash up on shore, and it's too deep for them to rise to the top. That's the metaphor being used. What patience would wait as we constantly roam? What father so tender is calling us home? He welcomes the weakest, the vilest, the poor. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. The name of the song, His mercy is more. What riches of kindness He lavishes on us. That's a phrase that Papa uses that Paul used in Ephesians. We are lavished in God's love. We are lavished with God's grace. What does that word mean? If you're an only child of rich, rich parents, and they gave you so many presents, any time there was any cause, any reason, any excuse to give presents, to where they finally filled up your room and they had to build another room to put all your presents in, you might have an idea what lavished means. I hope you haven't, because that's not necessary, and that's parents who need to have some control. But it's the only way to understand lavish. You are given so, 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 so much more than you really need. His mercy is more. My sins, they are many, but his mercy is more. What riches of kindness he lavished on us. His blood was the payment. His life was the cost. We stood neath a debt we could never afford. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more, stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. That's what Paul is trying to tell us here. It's what he tried to tell us in the book of Ephesians when he talks about that gift of grace being lavished upon us. It's just abundant. It's just abundant. God's not holding out on you. And if you have more sins, there's more grace. The next discussion, well, if more sins, more grace, I'll just not worry about the amount of sin that I produce. That's next week. More sin, more grace, that's not what we're to look at because we died to sin. If we died to sin, we don't get to entertain that mental idea of, well, if I sin more, I'll just have more grace. Big deal. That's next week. Um, consequently, verse 18, just as the result of one trespass was condemnation for all men, so also the result of one act of righteousness was justification that brings life for all men. I can't answer the question I'm about to raise to where it's fully answered, I don't think. But I just have to know that it's the truth. It's, it's a spiritual truth. What did I do that deserved a death on the cross of someone over 2,200 years ago? I wasn't alive. Why did my sin put Christ on the cross? And when you study with people that don't have a background in spiritual matters, in Old Testament understandings or anything, what are you saying? I'm guilty when I wasn't alive? I did not murder Jesus. In fact, I wouldn't have. I'm uh, not so sure of that. But all we know is that when he went on the cross, he took care of the sins of those in the past, the Old Testament, present, those who were living then were under the baptism of John's edicts, and also the Jews, the old law was still in effect. But upon his death, the old law was taken away, replaced by the new covenant, and it stretched forward to us, this side of the cross. 
But what do you see? You see the metaphor of a cross. Past, present, future on that day when the sins of mankind were placed upon Christ as that atoning sacrifice. It's hard to understand. The best way I can explain it that unless he died for my sins, he had the right to condemn me and take me to eternal destruction the first time I sinned. The first time. But that's not what he did. He made possible when I was a sinner, am a sinner, that it's not immediate that things are brought to bear. The cross points to something else. And we'll see it in Romans 5, the first 11 verses. It points to a Savior through the Holy Spirit, uh, the two of them interceding for us. It's coming judgment. And it gives me sometimes many years to make it right. It's not immediate. And God had that right to let the one sin condemn us and it be brought to bear immediately. But that's not in place. But what did he tell us? Adam to Moses, there was no law, but was there still trespass or sin? And did death still reign? Yes. Uh, so it begs to ask the, uh, and answer the question, what purpose is the law? And we alluded to that in Romans 2 and 3. It's to make us aware of a need of a Savior. Galatians talks about the law as a schoolmaster to bring us along to understand a lawgiver has that right to require living under the law, but we can't perfectly keep it to put God in our debt. So the law was given to point us to Christ. It's the schoolmaster pointing us to Christ. When you sin, you need to do something about it. God provides the provision. He, he provides it in abundance. To Christ, there's an abundant blessing of that gift. He says, the law was added so that the trespass might increase. Verse 20. Um, the best way I know to explain that verse is that sometimes as a child, I did not know mom and dad would be upset with me for doing certain things. When the law is made known or given, just using this metaphor, then I knew well, mom's not going to like that. Dad's not going to like that. And because the law makes someone aware of things that are right or wrong, sin will naturally increase. There will be more sin because you're aware of more things that mom and dad are unhappy with or God judges as sinful. I don't think they were confused in Matthew 5, but when Jesus starts saying, you know that it said, thou shalt not commit adultery, but I say to you, if a man lust after a woman in his heart, could be a man or a woman, then he's committed adultery already in his mind. It doesn't seem as if that would have been understood until Jesus came and made those statements. I didn't commit physical adultery with someone, but I did it in my mind, and God equates it as adultery. If you're lusting in your heart, your mind, toward another person. So, one, I didn't do it, but this would suggest I may have done that several times. So the law has increased sin my awareness of this thing, which is a sin. Um, I've shared my older brother. I brag about him a lot, and sometimes I just have to use him as an example. T. 
10th grade, Chattanooga, Tennessee. I remember many times sitting in a classroom, and Michael, my oldest brother, I'm the second, would say, well, it seems like if you've lusted after someone, which is considered adultery, you might as well have sexual sin and do it physically. And the teacher, Brother Beeler, at that time, oh, Mike, oh, Mike, because <laughs> he had heard this kind of reasoning before. It's looked at God in a similar way, but my committing adultery in my mind, which is wrong by God, hasn't hurt someone's spouse or their children. It hasn't affected the people involved, the one who committed the adultery in his mind, and the one who knew nothing about it, overtly doing it, even though it's wrong in the mind, doing it for real affects sometimes multitudes of people and sometimes for generations. So it's not okay to go ahead and do it because of the ramifications, but God is saying it's not something we should do. We need to make it right. Uh, ask for forgiveness for acting in your heart or in your mind adultery toward another person. And other examples in the Gospels. Law was added so that trespass might increase. It was to raise our awareness of things God did not want us to do. It was to raise our awareness. But where sin increased, grace increased all the more. My sins, they are many. Sin increased. His mercy is more. Grace increased all the more. Matt Papa used mercy, but similar word of grace. Grace is God giving us what we deserve. Mercy is God not giving us what we deserve. Give me mercy. What do I deserve? Well, I'm going to withhold what you deserve. I'm going to extend mercy to you. Grace is God giving us what we don't deserve. Mercy is God not giving us what we deserve. One is more about the gift and the other is more about the punishment. But um, where sin increased, grace increased all the more. So that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Comparison, sin through one man, eternal life, grace through one man. How they inter were interwoven from the time of the Garden of Eden up to the law, Moses, and until Jesus, our age, the Christian age, he tries to explain it here, to help us to understand it here. Um, the religious sinner of Romans 2 could raise his hand here and say, well, I don't sin as much as other people. I'm naturally good. I'm naturally good. Well, but sin shows you to be a lawbreaker. The law was given to make us aware, and sin actually increased with the knowledge we were aware of something being sinful. And then, of course, he's telling us again, death reigned through sin, righteousness reigns through the gift of grace. Adam and Jesus Christ. Hope that hasn't been too confusing. Uh, I hope that we've cleared up a few things Hopefully not made them worse, but um, thank you for being here and thank you for your interest.